How's everybody doing today? All right. Uh, it's good to see you all. Some familiar faces. I'm gonna start by letting these great people up here uh, introduce themselves. You want me to go first? Uh, my name is Ray. I work over at Creative Loafing Tampa Bay. It's a 33-year-old alt weekly. Uh, we write about the arts, uh, news, food. Um, it's kind of like a things to do. I don't, I don't know how many people are huge fans of alt weeklies, but they've always been a part of my life. It's just we have a live music calendar that's growing now because of COVID coming back. So I've written about music and other things in town for the last 10 years almost. I used to write for the Tampa Bay Times, um, Reacts Magazine briefly. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, check one. My name's Jim Chambers. I own Jim Chambers Music Box, the finest music academy on the planet, located over in Carrollwood. That's a music academy. Uh, we have four bands under management. My past includes um, record label work for about 25 years. I think that's why I'm here today. I'm happy to speak to all of you. That was dope. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that was Pretty, pretty eloquent. My name is Cliff Brown. I know a, a lot of people in here um, feel like this is my neighborhood. Lately, uh, we have 5-5 five five Studios. I own and started 5-5 five five Studios with some other local dudes in here um, as kind of uh, a, a refuge. And we wanted to model a lot of the studios that we work with in Atlanta. Like, um, you know, if any of you guys have been out there, Patchworks and these great places that you go to and you go there because you know in the next room there's so-and-so in the next room there's so-and-so so if you're in the lounge you're going to be able to create opportunities to write and work with other people and, and collab and um, I've lived here my whole life traveled and uh, kind of uh, been all over the globe but came to Tampa uh, to put the studio specifically to create the scene and, and build a, a better scene so our artists that are from Tampa quit going to LA and Atlanta and New York. They stay here and rep Tampa and be proud of it. Um, so yeah, uh, music producer started a uh, production company called the Justice League when I was younger and went on to work for like CTE and um, uh, some other other labels. And right now, just my heart is for, for you guys to be able to become successful and stay in Tampa. So um, yeah, excited to be here tonight. All right, just going to start off with um, our first question, and it is, um, how did you get your start in your career? Um, for me, it was, you know, I've been coming to Ybor for as long as I can remember. I went to HEC after I failed out of USF and was working at radio there and just found myself in the clubs with going to shows, and I couldn't afford it, so I started writing about music because I was already working at the newspaper. Uh, that turned into writing for a magazine called Reacts. Uh, writing for Reacts turned into a gig writing about live music for the Tampa Bay Times, which I did for six years. Um, at the same time, I started pitching and freelancing to Creative Loafing, and my editors there were kind enough to give me regular work, and um, I just kept turning stuff in. A job became available. Um, I've been full-time at Creative Loafing, I don't know, six years? five years, something like that now. I've been editor-in-chief for three years, something like that. It's probably the same thing as everybody else here. I just kept going. I don't know how to do anything else, so. Cool, Ray. <laughs> um, With a lot of help from Jim. Yeah, I helped him the whole way. Uh, everybody get some popcorn. Uh, I'll just take a minute, because sometimes this is interesting. Um, I was a music junkie. Uh, as a young boy, um, my father would take me to the record bar and we'd buy singles. And then as that just continued to expound, I mean, music's in my blood. And I think you know what I mean. It's in my bones. Um, ohms make, are in my bones. So that just really meant continued and continued. And then in high school, my mother, I said, Mom, can I call Capitol Records and get them to send me a bunch of posters? And she said, yeah. Go ahead. And back then, you know, long distance was 75 bucks a minute. So I realized there was a business within music. I couldn't believe it. I was 16, and I was able to do that. That's, you know, just some background. That's how heavy I was into it. And then when, once I entered college, 
I didn't go into, I got a degree in business management, but all throughout college, all I did was work at the radio station, book all the bands, work for CAB, College Activities Board, just, just jumped as far as I could. I would come to panels like this anywhere, um, just to try to f sense what it's all about. As I was at the radio station um, quite a bit, I, you know, you start getting service from record labels and you kind of figure out what their role is in, in, in the radio station world. I graduated college. Um, I, in, in, in that, I was booking a lot of college bands. I moved to Atlanta and um, I went to, my father taught me this new concept called networking. <laughs> Uh, and he, I just went to the guy at Wax and Facts, a record store. I said, do you know anybody at Labels? And he goes, sure do. Call a job at this guy at Chrysalis. So I call that guy at Chrysalis. Before I know it, I'm in his office. I'm just trying to talk my way in office. I was in a business suit and a briefcase, green as they come out of college. But I knew a little something, something about records. So finally, he says, if you can't get into record label world, try retail. And at the time, you know, record stores were on every block. Um, I worked for Turtles Records. They were here too. I used to service Specs and Coconuts and all these stores. I started at Turtles uh, Retail Management School. And there I was behind the reg, you know, checking out Alcaz Records all day. Learned a lot there. Got fired. But anyways, from there, I, I realized all these Warner Brothers reps and every label you can think of from Universal, uh, you name it, Motown had a rep, Capitol had a rep. They would come in and hang displays. Well, I wanted to be them so bad. So I figured out how they got their job. Every branch, every label had a branch in every major city. I'm in Atlanta. I started calling those branches and just banging on those doors. And um, sure enough, the first, well, I started working for a very small indie. They were the greatest indie. Um, I won't go into that. But I finally got a knock with a, a major, it was Sony. They moved me to Miami. That was my first job as a, a poster hanger. Couldn't believe it, was so thrilled. I finally got in the major label system. I stuck around. Um, I worked for Sony BMG up until the Olympics. A label called from New York, Sire Records, a division of hybrid. They, they called me from New York. They moved me from Atlanta to New York in 96 Olympics. I worked there till 2009 for VH1, a myriad of labels, um, mostly indie, some major, and then um, came here in 2009, opened a music school, um, you know, started, started to use my background and really cultivate young people here. I, we have, at any given time, four to five bands under management, which doesn't sound like anything, but my, I mean, with my background, we do just complete record label stuff from soup to nuts, photo shoots, make records. So I'm still in that bubble. And um, that's why I'm here today. Okay, I know it was long. Go ahead. That was awesome. I like stories like that. Just tell me the whole thing in less than five minutes, though. And I'm not drinking. Hey. <laughs> yeah, my story kind of echoes uh, Ray a little bit, a little bit of both. Um, but with Ray, like, I grew up on the streets of Ebor, and here we are 25 years later, <laughs> like, right here, it's sneaking, into, sneaking into bars, sneaking into clubs, um, getting taking off wristbands from Empire and having your, your, your homie that was older put it on you, you know, and get a new one, um, just to meet people. So uh, always was in bands, punk rock bands, reggae bands, hip hop bands. This was kind of when it was all, you know, I guess the sublime, sublime era. If some of y'all are familiar with that, it was a, a mixture of everything. Uh, and then I met a friend of mine, his name is Coleon, um, Kevin, he's from Plant City. He's, he was part of Justice League. But I, I met him through a friend and went in this little trailer where he was living at. And uh, he had, you know, his computer and, and uh, all his gear, like record everything on an SM58 microphone. Like and he was putting out all these records. And I was like, well, who's the band? He's like, I played everything. Like, what do you mean, bro? You played everything. He, uh, he goes, yeah, you know, you can do all my keyboard. And that kind of put me on to what a real music producer is, right? Like in uh, coming from the world of, uh, of being in bands, we depend on everybody else. But this was the first time that I saw somebody, you mean you don't have to like pay thousands of dollars for a studio and for other musicians and stuff. So I played every instrument. So we started working together and uh, uh, our friend, um, Eric, Eric Ortiz is uh, Rook from Justice League. He was, he was living in St. Pete at the time. And uh, 
he had a uh, ASN, he would, you know, make beats, not an MPC, but ASN is like a keyboard. And uh, that's what put me on to, you know, samples, these old records. He, he would take an old record and chop it up. Well, we had the idea to start replaying, you know, the, the chorus. We would take the sample and we would replay the whole record note from note. And uh, that way we're not limited to the sample, right? We could, we could go in and manipulate. So we would use the sample as an instrument and um, put it into the chorus and, you know, um, take it out when we want. And sometimes we didn't even use a sample, people. Would. So that's what kind of put us over the top. We signed a pub deal with uh, Warner Chapel at the time um, and uh, had a bidding war with Warner Chapel. They would come from Tampa. We didn't know, we were young. We were like, all right, let's, dope. We'll sign with you, Warner. Um, and from there, we started traveling to different studios. And uh, one thing that set us apart when we go to like Doppler or, or Tree Sound is we'd come in, I, I play trombone and flute and all these instruments, and we'd come in with a, a plethora of instruments, you know? And that kind of just, if you guys know you go to studios or go, maybe you have some at the house or maybe you work with other people and there, there's just one guy with a keyboard or, or some of you are like me and, and love digging in records. Well, we were kind of trying to change the sound of, of, of hip hop at that time, you know, um, to, to kind of do what uh, Guru from, I don't know if any Guru has, Jasmine Taz, like, the old, like that was one of my favorite records, how they would, bring in old school jazz. So we started like putting jazz on top of it and doing stuff. So we did, our first big break was, um, was uh, we worked with 112, this shows my age. Um, 112 and then uh, the, the next record uh, was uh, Young Jeezy's first album with Thug Motivation. We did uh, um, uh, Don't Get Caught. We did several uh, records on that album. We did um, Let's Get It and then the album got leaked and uh, we had to recut a brand new album with him, and so that kind of put us on with uh, um, with uh, Def Jam, and from there just started. We we were fortunate enough to work with Mary J. Blige, and um, kind of that was through Warner Chapel, which that kind of put me onto uh, getting very interested very quickly with with how record labels really work. Like Jim Jim stated, like I would, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? How do you do this? And um, it, kind of made me sick in a little bit um, because, <laughs> okay, like, let, let's break it down. At Warner Chapel, right, is part of Warner. They would sign the producer, us, get half of our publishing. Sign the artist, right, get half of her publishing. Sign the writers, get half of their publishing. They're walking away with like, you know, dollars to somebody's fractions of a penny. Um, but nevertheless, like you just learn and, and you do what you do. You can't be greedy when you're young. And even now, I, I find myself learning. Um, so from there, we started working with a uh, few other labels. I wanted to be a good dad. That was always important to me. You could have all the plaques you want on the walls with no family photos. So once you know, I knew I was going to be a dad, that was more important than the music industry ever was. So that's when I came back to Tampa and really tried to, you know, what can I do here? where I don't have to be gone all the time, where I don't have to be in these environments that I think, all right, it could go either one or two ways. Either we're gonna get shot, the feds are gonna come in, or we're gonna make a great record tonight. You know, it's a scary way to live. Um, so we just wanted to, to, to do right, you know? And uh, so coming here in Tampa, we, we've had a lot of opportunities, and even now, where we're still trying to build the scene. Like I said earlier, that's huge on us with Five Five Studios kind of do the same thing Jim does, like I'm a photographer, we, you got to be a jack of all trades in this industry, and um, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's my story in a, a nutshell, other than um, trying to run a couple other businesses that my wife and I own, um, our heart really is to, to pour back into Tampa right now, and uh, make this an opportunity where it's a little bit easier for the next generation, that way you don't have to go through a major label, you know, you can do everything yourself now, and I, I believe that, you know, and yeah. Cool, cool. All right. Uh, now that we've talked about all the glitz and, you know, accolades, you, you uh, talked about it a little bit. We're going to segue into what was one of the biggest uh, setbacks in your career that you learned from, like you learned the most from, one of the biggest setbacks. Um, as a journalist, I have setbacks every day. <laughs> 
they're called misspellings, corrections, you get facts wrong, or you totally uh, misread an artist in an interview and you fuck up a lot. And uh, it's pretty embarrassing. Uh, but when you're a journalist and you have to put stuff out every day, you just go to the next one, try to not make that mistake, own the mistake. Um, so um, my setbacks, I'm, they happen every day. They're, they're, it's hard, you know? Um, and I think when you make mistakes, you get better. Um, has there been a major setback? Thankfully not. Um, I still get to run a newspaper, uh, write about things I care about. I think Ray Loafing is the last local newspaper or website that really focuses on local artists. Um, you know, I was just talking with somebody the other day. He used to write for Mew magazine. I loved Mew so much, and that's gone. Uh, I feel like the more blogs, the better. I suppose the blogs are now on TikTok and things like that, but um, we still get to do it every day. So I, I don't know that there's been a major setback. Um, the pandemic's been hard, but uh, I have setbacks every day. So um, I don't know. I don't know if that's negative or not, but that's how I feel. So. Um, I think uh, I've had numerous, numerous setbacks all throughout life, and you will all have them, especially in this industry. Um, and we all know the cliche that you will learn from them, but you truly do. Um, I'll give you a funny one, just because there's so many, um, and there is a learning point at the end of it. Okay, Fishbone, you know the band? They had this record called Chim Chim's Badass Revenge. Well, Chim Chim is a monkey from a, com from a cartoon, um, Speed Racer, right? So I go out, I, I find a monkey. I find a monkey, and this monkey's going to hand out stickers at this giant Midtown Music Festival in Atlanta, because Fishbone's playing. They're going to hand out this sticker. On the back of that sticker, it's going to say $2 off at Criminal Records. What a genius marketing plan. This is great. So I send it over to Arista, and Arista which Fishbone was on Arista. <laughs> which is bananas. Anyways, um, fish or uh, anyway, so Fishbone gets wind that there's this marketing dude in Atlanta that's hiring an effing monkey at their show, and he's that they're gonna hire, have that monkey walking around. They went bananas. They went crazy. They yelled at the bar, the Arista person. That person came to me. What the? F are you thinking you can? What are you all wrong with you? And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. This is the most creative thing I've ever done in my life. What are you talking about? The thing I learned is, as creative and smart as you are, you, you, not only do you have to approve it with your artists, make sure that, you know, you're not always think. you got to think like them, too, and make sure that they approve it. I thought I was the smartest guy in the room, and I was not. I got in a lot of trouble for that. No monkeys. I think it's genius. <laughs> I think it's, it's a genius. great idea. No and good. With Fishbone being a ska band, like, I, I feel like, that's the that name of the record. Thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, setbacks. Um, welcome to the music industry. Yeah. Uh, you know, one day you're here, the next day you're here. You know, uh, I've had six figures plus in my pocket, and the next year I've been like, oh, man, I need some gigs, bro. <laughs> like, you know, um, you, you just got to ride it. Like, setbacks is what brings you to the next level. Um, the biggest thing that I could see, uh, not just for myself, I had to go through this when I was torn with other bands, um, but the biggest setback I see for most artists that come through the studio is the setback of me, right? You got to take yourself out of the situation. Um, it, you are an artist. That, that means uh, you are, yeah, you, you want to make art for yourself, but if you want to make a living and uh, you want to do right by other people and make music, you, you have to make music that other people want or are going to listen to, relate to, and build a fan base. Um, sometimes we get into the fact that, uh, like, oh, I'm an artist, it's about me, 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 I'm a producer, I'm the best producer in the world, me, 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 me. And, um, and I, I've never met somebody with that much pride or anybody that has a lot of pride that the fall is not like the old saying, you know, pride comes before the fall is true. Um, I had to go through that and, uh, you know, from being, uh, you know, in the limelight to nothing for a few years and you just reinvent yourself and you continue to build yourself. But the, the best thing you can do is what you're doing right now. You need to be a part of community where there's other artists. That way uh, you can realize that it's normal. 
right? It's normal, like, yo, what are you doing? You know, what, what are you struggling with? What are you achieving right now? So, um, yeah, that uh, music industry, like, just like Ray and Jim said, like, there's, there's so many setbacks, bro, so many. Like, to, to have a list, we, we would be here all night. I misquoted Santana once, and uh, he issued a correction on his website after that. It was the most embarrassing. I won't say it because the misquote was so bad because he was cussing so much in the interview that I thought he said what I thought he said, but it wasn't even close, and uh, it was bad. Yeah, he was playing Emily Arena like that week, and he pretty much called me an idiot on the internet. So, uh, what, let's let's um just really quickly from an artist perspective, I'm guessing raise your hand if you're an artist or you making music. Um, from your perspective, you know your your art's out there. You're naked as they come. You're putting your art out there. You say like it. Does this entertain you? I think we need to comment just for a minute on that perspective. Um, Man, you guys are all gonna get hit. Like you're gonna lose band members. You're gonna your hard drive is gonna flake. You're, everything's gonna happen to you, and it's really just just if if this is in your blood and you know, I call them lifers. If you're gonna do this for life, no matter what, just continue to pursue that. Just keep doing it. If you're still iffy, and you know what else? I think you need to know, and I don't know how you're going to go about doing this, but don't ask your grandma. Know if your material is good or not. Is it? I mean, if you've been just killing it for eight years and you're nowhere, even if it's in your blood, maybe it's just not good enough. So get somebody else to listen to it besides your grandma. But there are going to be endless setbacks. I mean, it, entertainment's almost set up for it. You're going up the stairs, knock, knock, knock. Hollywood, too. There's a lot of people that want that job. So just keep pursuing it. If it's in your bones, you're gonna, there's going to be plenty of tears and plenty of everything. But if it's in your bones, keep pursuing it and just don't give up. And that's real. I mean, you'll hear that endlessly. That's real. Okay. All right, all right. Um, should artists uh, still be looking for a &Rs in the climate to today? I think it's a better question for Jim and uh, Cliff, but I just, I'm working on a story right now, and I got to hang out with the band a couple weeks ago, and I had a lot of a &R conversations, obviously because of COVID and stuff, people aren't really doing like the traditional a &R thing, but a &R was a big deal for them. This band put out a record on God Mode and um, a connection that they had at God Mode put them in front of uh, somebody at a pretty big indie label, more known for indie rock bands, um, some rap artists, uh, Jungle Pussy, Jamila Woods. Um, but long story short, the a &R really liked what they did. Now they have a &R. They're going on a 22-day tour with a UK uh, rock band that's absolutely killer and matches their vibe even though they're a rap band and um, they got an advance that they liked um, they're still working at their jobs because their outlook is I can still make the music I love work my job and take this money from the label which is asking me to put out music and I can still make music and pocket this money so I didn't know the answer to that two weeks ago but I, th I mean I think it can still play a pretty pivotal part in what you want to do if that's part of what you want, you know? Um, just so everyone knows, A&R, artist and repertoire. Um, does that sound like mansplaining? I've been accused of that recently. I'm like, you know, I'm, shut up. I'll Anyways, tell you. Not everybody knows that. Um, all right, thank you, everybody. A&R is clear. All right, thanks, everyone. Just need to know who I'm talking to. Um, well, I think the quick, easy answer is no. Of course you don't need A&R, but it depends on what career path you want to take your art. Like, do you need business managers? Do you need a lawyer? Do you need a guy to help you shape and curb your music, A&R guy, shape, curb your music to appeal to the masses or your designated segment? Do you need that team to help the professional, formal way. Do you need that? Well, yeah, you should get A&R. 
shoot yes. Because you're going to need a professional team to professionally designate where you live and the whole thing. N now, on the flip side of that, DIY is the most beautiful, easiest thing to do in the history of music. We could go make a record right now. Go ahead, make one. And we'll have it on iTunes in six weeks. It's the easiest thing at work. Court, you don't need A&R. So it depends on your career, your trajectory. Do you want to be you know, a professional touring artist on a label? You're going to have A&R. If you want to DIY and kick it around, no. Yeah, I agree with what both of them said. Um, it's funny, last year in the middle of COVID, uh, on LinkedIn, there was, <laughs> I don't know why it popped up on, on you know, our feed, but we saw that their Universal was actually hiring an A&R uh, for the Miami area last year. And so I never really understood like what the job title of an A&R is until I saw it on LinkedIn. So it was all like stuff you wouldn't even think of, uh, spending hours on Adobe, going to FedEx, printing flyers, printing this, doing campaigns, setting up shows, meeting artists, going to all these shows, and then, but there was a lot, a lot of paperwork that went, I didn't, I didn't expect that to happen. Um, yeah, so, it, like he said, you need product first before you think if, if you need an A&R, like, what part of your career are you right now? You can go get an A&R right now and they could walk you into a label and that label would now take 90% of everything that you have, or you could build up your career here locally in, um, in the south, Southeast. You could set your own tours, you could, you could make your own product and be good at what you do, then talk to an A&R, and now you have, it's like any business, right? Now you have more room to negotiate. So it's a trick question, you know? It's like, you, you know, if you're good at cooking burgers, you know, you wanna have a food truck first or go get a restaurant? Like get a food truck first, start a reputation of that, then an investor will come to you and probably offer you 50-50 instead of, you know, 80-20, 90-10. So that would be my advice on that. And, and uh, one more thing on that too, is I don't trust anybody. I've always had that, you know, mentality, like everybody is out. And I think that's a good mentality to have in the music industry uh, with before you do your research, right? So um, if somebody comes up, oh yeah, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this, cool. How does that help me? Or, or cool, is that what you're doing right now? You know? Um, so it, it, anybody can build a website. Anybody can, um, you know, can, can say they are an A&R or, or, or some sort of uh, label representative. But uh, just like Jim said, like, he went through everything that he has done in the past as an A&R and, and beyond. And those are the people that you want and that you want to trust, right? Not somebody that A&R could be somebody's do boy, you know, the, the, the intern for Universal that just got the job a month ago. What are they going to do for you? I'm not saying you shouldn't be their friend and you shouldn't build that up, but you cannot put your trust, and, and this is what I'm getting to, you cannot put your trust that finding an A&R is going to be your break. And that, I've heard that my whole life. I don't want to get signed for what? What do you want to get signed for? You're not so they can take all your money? Yeah. If you're not doing shows like every weekend here in Tampa and you, you have a backyard, what, are you gonna, what is getting signed going to do for you right now? Absolutely nothing. You need to, you need to do it yourself for as long as you can. Um, build up six figures doing your own art and then go and see about um, meeting A&Rs and, and getting everybody, everybody else for your team. You know? yeah, I think a, a, a solid producer is... Um, kind of more what you need at the minute. And then once you two decide you have a product that's so ready to go to, to market, then then seek A and R. I, I think. Yeah, get some Spotify numbers first. I wanna I wanna add one more thing to that. This is a perfect example. There's um so we produce uh Dochi who knows who Dochi is, Brenna? Yeah, so we we produced her album at Five Five Studios. Um uh, me and Sean Callahan and a couple others made made the beats and did everything for it. She did everything herself, yeah. like everything herself. That's probably one of the hardest working artists in the industry right now. Did everything herself, wrote herself. She had her homegirl like kind of being her manager, calling people and, and you know, Kendrick just signed her. Like, so, um, you know, like, it didn't take an A&R, it took art and it took hustling and it took doing yourself. Like, make sure your art 
is up to, and don't think she wasn't waking up every single morning, coming up with bars and going to bed and, and perfecting her craft over and over and over and over and over again. You know, in this world that every every single one of you guys could put an Instagram and take some cool photos and, and kind of go to the club and like throw dollars in the air and do all this other garbage. There's somebody else that is at home, like perception, reading a dictionary and coming up with how many freaking rhymes that they can come up with, you know? So work on your craft and people will come to you. Yeah, I think that's like baked into everything. Like there's everything else that you have to do. Yeah. All right. So speaking about knowing if your music is good or you know just uh developing things are there um could you name some uh local resources that people can use you know or uh, how do you find these producers you know uh, to work with somebody to to shape your music your sound to to be more marketable and everything um i think just like with everything it's about participation I think you just have to be in the room, be willing to work with people, you know, um, ask around. You know, we call it networking or whatever, but you're really just hanging out in the place that you want to exist and the people that you're comfortable with and the people who you want to create art with. You talk about uh, perception. Amazing artist, so committed to the thing that he does. You know, I saw perception on Thursday and uh, he had just gotten done playing with Katara, uh, one of the greatest bands in town recently for sure. And then 30 minutes later, he was on stage rapping with uh, Christopher James, yeah. who was like one of the most soulful people I know, you know, and Jordan included in that conversation. And I think the only reason uh, Perception gets to have that opportunity is one, because Perception cares so much about what he does, like works so hard at it, but is also just always around, yeah. always around, just always asking uh, Mike Mass talks about it a lot, like, just be in the room, go to the shows, talk to the people, be accountable, and I think you end up in front of people who can are willing to work with you in the studio, you know, help you with this program, anything, whatever it is, even if it's not musical, right, just to, like, get better at what you're doing, because that's what you're asking, what are the resources, and then outside of that, Tampa is growing so fast, you have so many businesses and entities that are willing to help you, I mean, five, five, if you're not already doing like tutorial stuff, you know, like so many of the people that I talked to that are involved with that studio, um, even Sam before over at Dojo Sounds. I mean, everybody I know that works over there is so helpful. Um, Symphonic, um, super helpful. And then on the DIY thing, I mean, you could talk to Jordan right there. I open every one of Jordan's newsletters, <laughs> like, you know, and I only, I love Jordan because one day I was wasted. I walked into New World and he was playing some song and I was like, what the heck is going on? And I've loved Jordan's music ever since then. But he, I know that Jordan works really hard on, on things and I know Jordan doesn't do it alone. You know, Jordan gets a lot of help from a lot of people in his life and, and musically and Jordan's always around. And I'm sure everybody else here is in their particular scene, but you just have to show up and ask for the help. I know it's hard, like a lot of people aren't built to like talk to people and stuff. But however you can get in front of people and push yourself to get out of your comfort zone and just ask for help and give help, I don't think you can. I mean, there's always vultures out there, but if you keep it like that, you know, I think you have a good shot. Man, I forgot the question. What? Oh, uh, what Sorry. are some of the, <laughs> what Thanks, are some of the resources to? I'm kidding. I just wanted to <laughs> slam Ray one time. Um, you know, I don't know of any resources to find producers. I do know, I mean, the way I would, I do know a couple. I I usually produce myself, but um, the guys that own these studios, Ronnie D over at All Access, he probably knows 10 producers. All you gotta do is look at their contacts, like the other studios in town, Red Room, whatever it is, go down there at contact. Hi, I'm looking for a hip hop, I'm looking for a rock producer. Can you give me a name? They'll give them to you, because they want to. Um, is that the kind of thing where it just, um, and then also online, I mean, Tampa Bay Music News, they, they work with, they post um, a couple producers quite often. So it's just, you just gotta ask around. That's, that's, I've, that, that's, that's about the end of my toolbox on that one. Yeah, do what you're doing right now. I mean, this is the best place to meet people, right? Like a bunch of artists in one room at one time. Uh, we were kinda, we're waiting to see what happens with Obviously, with COVID, we're, we're open, we're closed, we're open, we're closed. But uh, 
that what we wanted to do as a studio um, under at the bricks because if y'all we're above the bricks, so we have kind of the best of both worlds. We can go downstairs, grab a beer, come upstairs, and go watch a show. Come up. Um, we wanted to do more like a creatives night, a Monday night or Tuesday night in Tampa, somewhere for people to come and vibe and like work on you know songwriting workshops. Call it so I, I hate saying songwriters night. Like I hate that. I don't know why. But every time, because they're everywhere, and I just think of a, a, a hippie with a guitar, like, you know, we're going to write together. But a place for, for you to meet people, um, if you want to meet anybody, go to, go to ODS tonight. Like, get, get done with here and walk over the crowbar tonight. Yeah, Charlie and, Chase will be there. Sandman will be there. Yeah. Slop Funk Dust will be and, there. Who is here? Yeah, just, just meeting people, being out. Uh, when I was younger, um, we used to uh, go to all these clubs like Empire back in the day, or, um, and we'd go and see Sandman to, bro, play this, please play this record, and bring him our, our CDs, and like, and, and it, it, he's got the biggest heart. He actually would play it. I don't know, some of it was all right, some of it was probably garbage, but we would just build these relationships with people and, and get out and you meet people. Um, yeah, yeah, just go, get out. Um, Resources, I mean, this is Ray Roa with Creative Loafing right here. Like, shake the man's hand, get a card, send him music. Just because he doesn't write about it or, or maybe do something right then doesn't mean, you know, doesn't mean there's a door sign. Just keep doing it. Email him every day if you have to. Persistency is key in this, um, in this uh, industry, you know. That is not a setback. If you send your music out to 200 people and two people write about it, when... Yeah, yeah, just I don't let stuff Jim's like that. There's example. a lot of that. Jim uh, sent me a lot of stuff in the mail. Uh, every day, this guy. He, like, sends me physical mail over the years. Yeah, I do. And I don't even really need, well, I won't say that. I love having Ray's attention, but I just like him, and I send him stuff. No, <laughs> I, I agree with that. I always felt like nobody should ever feel like they need to be written about because it's your art. Uh, you shouldn't care what I think about what you do, you know. It should be fulfilling for you. Um, but at the same time, Cook's right. Like, I love getting emails. If you email me every day, I'll tell you when to stop or if I've had, you know, hey, give me a break. But I can't write about everything all the time, but it's really the artists who will just bear with me just because there's just a lot. And then I just say, hey, I think I can write about this. this. Will you give me a heads up then? And then I can write about it. Pusha Preem is a good example of that. I mean, Pusha Preem was on their own trajectory anyway. But I could never write about Push Supreme, and finally I got to, and all this stuff's happening. But I can't tell you how many times Push Supreme's emailed me, and I didn't write about it. You know, same with a lot of people. You know, real it, quick too. Oh, right, real quick. The best way to communicate with people, as like Ray, what's the best way? I think personally, it's email off the off the socials. What's the best way to get? Even though you're just gonna say, okay, they're playing such and such, delete. What do you read? What don't you read? I used to say, contact me anywhere. Um, I stopped responding to Facebook messages just because there's too many. Um, email is really great because you can't lose it. Email. And you, yeah, you can hit the snooze button. You can time it for a, a different time. Like, I can organize email and I can search email. I can't search other stuff. Um, I don't know if we want to get into this conversation, but there's obviously ways to send electronic assets and things like that. But. And we were talking about perception earlier. I think he's a perfect example of, of what being available, you know, looks like. Um, there's never been an opportunity where, I, hey, bro, I need you to come run a session for us tonight. Bet, I'm there, bro. Perception, I need you to write for this artist. Bet, I'm there. Like, you know, um, and he's just being beloved and, and being good to people and building those relationships, man, that goes a long way. Um, and perfect example, we, we are executive producing uh, Katara's album at the studio, and that came about from, you know, uh, um, you know, Natalie being available. There's a good example, like, yo, I need a drummer. She came through, then I got to meet Seth, and I was like, this is the most talented musician I've ever seen in my life, and I've known John Shea forever. Um, so I was like, bro, whatever you need, record the whole thing. Uh, obviously, Perception's in the room a lot because of the studio, so he met them. So now that's his band doing shows like Rock the Park and stuff that they're doing just because he was available and, and put himself out there and he humbled himself. Like, you know, you don't walk in the room every time you're like, look at me, I'm a star. 
you walk in the rooms like I'm here to help. What do you What do you need? Like honestly, a servant heart goes a long way. Um, and I agree with email as well. You know, sometimes if you text somebody, I'll get a text from an artist. You know, you might meet. I give my number to everybody. Like, oh, hit me up. But then be a few weeks, and then some. This doesn't happen a lot, but I'm sure it's happening to you guys. They'll text you one time, then they'll text you another time, then the third one's like, all right, F you, bro, done. Like, I, if I join the club with my mom and my grandma right now, and like all these people, because text, it gets buried. Like, it's, some of y'all probably, y'all got so many friends, like, y'all can't keep up with it. But uh, email, email definitely. And take them up on that. Y'all put music out, email it, email it to them, you know? Nice. Um, what are, what are the elements of a solid marketing campaign, and how do you make a marketing campaign feel authentic? Um, I'm like somewhere in the weird process of marketing campaigns, because I think you've already built out a marketing campaign by the time it gets to me. Um, and all I really need um, on my end is, uh, so I guess this is where you just talk about easy uh, electronic assets, your EPK. Um, I think people still use sonic bids, but Nobody, I don't download music anymore, so a lot of times when artists send me things, I ask for a private stream or something like that. Um, all your high res, I still, we still put out a print uh, issue. Some people think it's dated, I love it. Um, but high resolution assets available to download somewhere are super important. There'll be weeks when uh, I wanna use a certain band's picture and I don't have it, so I don't get to use, it's, it sucks in, on my part, because one, I didn't have it ahead of time, because maybe I didn't ask, but two, I got a write-up that I love. I can't put a picture on it. Um, that's always frustrating. Um, so high-res assets, streaming stuff, um, make your emails as concise as possible. Um, I get a lot of PR emails where people try to like tell me like a story, like some weird, weird story like in the beginning, and it's like, man, for me, I just kind of want to know what's going on with you real quick, and then if I like the song, and I'm probably gonna reach out and say, hey, are you playing here locally? You know, so I wanna know when your shows are happening and then um, can we talk a little bit more about the song so I can write about your show in the context of the song? Um, things like that, just real stripped back information. Um, that's how I like to receive marketing campaigns. Um, but as far as building one, I mean, that's, that's on y'all. That's your plan, not mine. I'll just react to it. Yeah, I mean, gosh. That question is very difficult. You know, marketing campaigns can be a book, they can be a page, they can be $300 or $30 million. So that's a big question. So let me just try to just kind of frame it. Um, I mean, I, when I think of, you know, the five pips of the crown of a marketing campaign, you gotta have traditionals in there too. So you gotta have you gotta have red, you have to have traditional print. Somebody's gotta send somebody something to him and TVT and all those pieces of paper. Radio, you gotta send it to everybody. 97, 88.5, everybody, no matter what, send it to them. Send it to the radio. Then, shift it over to online, just online. That has, that's gonna be a big pip. Every single one of them, Insta, Facebook, TikTok, even everyone that you like, particularly YouTube, make sure they're all covered and have a budget in mind to spend there. You want to spend money on the social. So you got trad, this, that. All right, media outlets. There's plenty of places to get some video coverage. Send it over to MNF for Friday morning. You know, call Fox News Coffee Morning Suck Show, whatever those shows are, and just try to send it to them. Um, and just have an active plan written where every single thing of those four pips, I could think of you know, those five pips, and do something in every one of those areas. Find, it's not hard to find out who you send um, or just email your record to at, say, the T TVT or Fox News who, like, you know, send it to Charlie Belcher for crying out loud. Uh, uh, just cover everything. And I think in this scope, you know, this is not record label stuff. This is just kind of like, kind of DIY scope. You got 500 bucks you want to spend. Now, and I'll, I'll be done. I, I think 
What I have found is that feeding Facebook and Insta, it's fine. You got to know where your people live, right? For me, they live on Google. So I have found all I need to do is feed the Googler. No more Facebook ads for me, no more Insta, because they don't translate to students coming to my school. So that's how the, I need that to work. Those don't work for me. They work for band. They don't work for a music school. Facebook, anyway. So my point is, I use Google exclusively for marketing now. I would suggest that too. If you've got your stuff on SoundCloud, get all of your information, metadata in, into Google and do a Google campaign and see if it works better than Facebook with regard to eyeballs, who's listening, who's pr pressing click. Okay. Yeah, there's, you're a business, right? You're an artist, but you're a business. That's number one. You need to recognize that right now. Um, if, if I put $10,000 into a product, but I didn't account money to market it or you know then i'm foolish then I, I just spend a bunch of time and wasted time um so i always tell artists when they when they come to us or if they come and they want to produce you know me to produce an album my first question is like what are you going to do with this album because you're going to waste your time and my time right now if you don't have a, a a plan together of some sort i would rather you produce one song take the money that you're going to use in the studio for the rest of the album and put that into some sort of marketing campaign um, I mean, y'all know the basics, website first, right? You know, like, you, it, I can't tell you how many times somebody has, like, sent music or, or, or like, yo, I'm an artist, uh, tag me in something, and then you go back and you can't find anything on them, like, nothing on them. Uh, it, it's like, for example, doing shows without having merch. Like, it's cool, like, but merch is what they remember you by, you know? Um, so go spend a couple grand on some t-shirts. It'll pay for itself. Do that first, do something first. Put, get something, do, just do something other than just music. Um, but you need to have a plan together. Um, first thing that I would say is, is it may not be a long time investment. It may just be uh, right here, right now. But even if it's your sister, your cousin, your brother, your best friend, um, some sort of family member, most managers start out as a family member. It's not, you don't go to a management company and it's like, I want you to manage me. Um, now, sometimes that happens, but for the most part, you're gonna start out with somebody else helping you and they have to treat it like a full-time job. And you have to treat your art as a full-time job. Um, you know, you may work 40, 50 hours a week. Well, guess what? Stay up till one, two in the morning every night, working on your music, working on your website. Like he said, with Google, Google's huge. If you have a website, start a blog. It, it, write a blog every day and put Tampa and whatever, mu your name and Tampa and music in there every single day. Tampa artist, myself, whatever, like whatever your name, I know Jacob, yeah, uh, Tampa, Tampa artist Jacob Davies wrote a song this morning, it was awesome. Check it out on my SoundCloud, I don't know, but the more you do that, the more the Googler, like he said, works in your favor, and that's, that's called SEO. So do everything you can on your end first, before you, you, you start investing money into it. But I, I would say save some money, invest some money in yourself. Uh, when, you hear, when, when you hear an artist on the radio, a lot of times that artist will ride one song for a year. It, it, you know, uh, it, There's a campaign behind that song, but they'll ride one song. Now, I'm sure you guys can both agree, like you wanna put out music as much as you can. We live in an age of, of, of quantity but invest into one song, invest in yourself. And uh, so, yeah, a marketing campaign, either way. Dochi, she didn't really have a campaign. She had good music. Um, uh, there's a, a band called Visit Neptune that we produced last year. We did have to put quite a bit of a music campaign in them because they needed to do something very fast because they were all going to college. They knew that. They are like, this is our last hurrah. Let's put it. So we put a campaign together. We worked with Creative Loafing and other, other um, you know, other local publications to, to put it on there and just got them some bigger shows. Um, right now, we're, I'm managing Kenzie Wheeler. Uh, he's a country artist. We do a lot of with country, I mean, we're in Florida. If you grow up in Florida, you listen to like Keith Sweat and Keith Whitley, I guess. So um, you, you grow up listening to country too. <laughs> like, um, so we're, we're, we're putting Kenzie right now all over the country. So in two weeks, we're in Buffalo and then Erie 
and then Nashville, and then, so marketing campaign for us is like now, instead of just our own backyard, we got to figure what are all the publications over there, what are the indie radios that are letting us do it, and it's a hell of a lot of work, hell of a lot of work right now, um, but we have a, a, a big team, so do what you can right now with the resources you have, but make sure, make sure you put money into you. You cannot be an artist that's not investing in yourself and expect others to invest in you. And if you're an artist right now and you're putting out music just expecting people to listen to it um, and you're like not spending money on yourself, then it's going to fail just like if you had a plant and you're not watering it. Same thing, man. You got to invest in yourself. I got another question real quick too. All right. Um, out there in the audience there, uh, how many of you do shows? Hands up. So everybody's doing shows, right? All right, would you, do you ever spend a couple bucks on like Facebook ads to see if it puts more asses in seats? Have you ever done that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good exercise to go through, right? I mean, it's as simple as that. You, put, you spend 30 bucks over 10 days and you see if it sells you any more tickets. Well, what I found is it doesn't work at all. <laughs> Which, you know, like the, the payout rate is like 1%, you mean, so 100 people say yes, they're coming to the show via your ad, and one will come. I mean, it's really low. There's another setback. Don't expect people to come to your shows. So I'm just curious if any of that has worked for you. Um, yeah, I think you've answered my question. Uh, but again, I mean, marketing plans can be so involved, and, and they usually are. If you see a marketing plan from a label, I mean, it is a small book. It's all written out. It's timed out. But in this scope, I think that if you just try and, and formally write it for yourself, just, okay, you know exactly who to write to, and it's these, these, and these, and just write up and actually execute it. You'll feel good about it. You put your art forward, and you're like, hey, this is what they told me to do, and it makes sense. Well, let's try it. Um, what are some uh, marketing trends that, uh, that you've noticed re like more recently? Uh, uh, could you name some of those uh, marketing trends, like the big ones now, like the, the, the bigger ones now, other than we talked about Google. Cranberry now. juice, skateboarding. No. <laughs> big marketing trends. I mean, TikTok is the cray-cray, right? I mean, are all of you on there? Who's doing TikTok stuff? Yeah, man. <laughs> I mean, do you guys agree TikTok is where you should be and you're still hung up on Instagram because <laughs> you don't want to learn a new platform? That's where I'm at. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like a major boomer in this sense. Like, I just, I've, I've been on TikTok three times, and I can't get into it for some reason. And uh, so, trends, I don't know, man. I, I work at a newspaper, right? So it's a very rooted thing, but I'm lucky to work at a newspaper that has a very core mission that hasn't changed. Local artists, local this, local that. Like, it's really clear. Kenzie, I, the only reason I know about Kenzie as of last week, because I love the voice and shit like that, but I try not to watch it because I get addicted, um, is because Sammy Hughes from Five called me, and, and I know Sam from other music that Sam's made, and he said, hey, we're working with Kenzie. He's playing the Dallas Bull. And <laughs> Sam knows, or maybe he doesn't, that when I hear Dallas Bull, I want to write about it because it's a show happening at Dallas Bull by a kid who was on The Voice at Plant City, so it's all still very traditional. I don't know if it's a groundbreaking method you know it's i know sam because he was the first rapper to do a album release show at skippers i know sam uh, because of you know the music that he makes and he just called me i have a local show here's the deal with kinsey i don't know if i'm gonna write a 900 word profile on kinsey but i'm definitely gonna do a show preview um, i'm definitely gonna listen to a lot of kinsey's music and i know i can't talk a lot about what's going on with what how you're developing kinsey because it's a really cool strategy but now, forever, until Kinsey breaks, which Kinsey might in music, in country particularly, pretty soon, I'm going to be so happy that Sam just called me. So I don't know if that's a good answer for your question, yeah. but I don't know any trends. Uh, I just do it the old school way. So. I can give you, uh, he, gosh, there's so many trends, and then you think you see it, and then you think you know. Let me just try to paint a picture for you a little bit. Um, I think one, this is an old trend, and it's not a trend, it's more of an overview. So think about it like this. As, as an individual artist now, you are able to set up 50 channels in the road. You got 50 channels, man. So set up all those channels, and all those channels are TikTok, Insta, 
YouTube, Facebook, every single one of them, Spotify, every one of them. And those channels trickle pennies. That's all they do. And you, all you have to do is have an aggregator, which is um, a bucket, and you just collect those pennies. And the more that you get people to look at those things, at the end of the month, you're going to have $303. Well, okay, look at you. You're a professional artist. Just try to think of it that way, sort of. Um, and that's not a trend. That's been going on for a long minute now. But if you're not engaged in that sort of thinking about where your money's going to come from, um, you know, vertical marketing, this is what that's called, try to get all your ducks in a row that they're all chucking pennies in your bucket every day. And that'll, that'll grease some wheels. Um, trends, you know, I really, any, I don't have television. I cut the cable a long time ago. Um, and I really shun from marketing because I don't like to be marketed to. I'm a Gen X person, marketing. So I really, it's true, although I'm involved in it to some expect. So I'll pass down the mic. <laughs> that reminds me of uh, Ralph Breaks the Internet. I got a four-year-old, so it's like, I don't know, y'all seen Wreck-It Ralph or Ralph? Like, yeah. all, you get these hearts, and you get enough hearts, you get money, and it's kind of the same thing, like how many, it, you know, likes and, and plays and views uh, you know, they, they add up after a while. Um, as far as TikTok goes with music, it, it's hit or miss with TikTok. You know, you can make a lot of TikToks that nobody's going to watch. You know, you could be on Instagram with no followers, but then it just takes one to break. So it's kind of like going Seminole Hard Rock. You want to go gamble? You could you could hit it big or, you know, but why not try, right? Um, uh, for TikTok, like my, my wife and I, we do... Um, we own a couple wedding companies. We do around 10 weddings every weekend, and we just bought a bridal shop. Um, so I had to, uh, you know, hire what's called bridal stylists. And one of them, her job is to post on TikTok and Instagram. That is her job um, because that is how girls are finding dress shops. Like, who would have thought? So she paid her to make TikToks every day. Yeah, but uh, there's success there. I mean, one of, now that you're saying that, one of our photographer who had shot for us quite a few times, Marla Miller started a TikTok, and dude, I don't know. She just worked at it every day, though, too. Yeah. Was just doing videos, and now she has, like, I don't know, 30,000-something followers. It's just growing. So, yeah, I mean, you have to do it, right? If you're good at it, freaking go for it. Just keep shooting, like, especially if, if you can just do a little bit of work, like an hour a day or something, and just get better all the time. I always think of Tom G, like, what if, like, City Boy was it like during the freaking, like, TikTok age? He would be, oh, like... Yeah. You know, I can imagine, you know, or like Rod Wave, you know, listen to Rod Wave talk about his songs uh, take off on TikTok. But at the same time, Rod Wave was also doing shows at like, I don't know if they were strip clubs, but like off, like off hour strip clubs with like high school kids. Like you still have to do the work on the ground. It, it's a crazy world we live in right now because uh, it, uh, unfortunately you have to stand out but you still have to make good music. So I, just because it's, it's fresh in my mind and in some of y'all's too, that little, that little clip on Dolce, like even that first verse, hi, my name's Dolce, like that went viral. And I feel like that's what led her to Kendrick and some others, but she, she thought of that before she wrote it, right? Like she thought like, I, this is I, visually, this is what I think, even that, minute, you forgot to let the chickens out. Like, just that, like, it's so weird. But it works on, on, on things like TikTok. That's something, I got a 13-year-old daughter. Like, that's what they do all day long. I don't understand it, but it works. Um, so it, be cognizant of that when you're, when you're writing music of, of, you know, I wouldn't say gimmicky, but you can, you can try to push the, push the status quo a little bit. Yeah. Um, what is the best example of guerrilla music marketing? That you've seen. My shit. Uh, I'll go again. So again, I exist in a different stage of the guerrilla marketing thing. Um, there was a place called Venture Compound that used to exist. It was a DIY space in St. Petersburg, and um, I covered the warehouse district uh, a little bit in more of an arts aspect. So I got to meet a lot of the people there. But Venture Compound in particular was doing a lot of shows. A lot of great DIY bands would come through do really stripped down, do-it-yourself shows, and Jesse would send me crazy shit. Like, 
thought he sent me a bag of cocaine one time and it wasn't, thank God, you know, in the mail. But uh, so, I mean, that definitely kept guerrilla, uh, you know, that guerrilla marketing kept Vetra Compound on my radar. Um, Jim has sent me some crazy stuff in the mail. I have eaten lots of candy. Me? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, that you've <laughs> sent. Um, and uh, I still use a lot of pranks that he sends me. He sends me like just dumb stuff. Like, you know, and, and when I first met Jim, I probably had the same impression that some of you have. Like, oh, this guy's kind of weird, kind of kooky. Like, you know, but it's like the longer I got to know Jim through our relationship that was all based in the paper and in music and in caring about the bands that um, came through your school and the bands that we got to write about through his guerrilla marketing because Jim was always in my ear, not like all the time, but I'd get a package from Jim or, or something. And I've had really great conversations with some of his bands. I've watched one of his drummers, uh, Bells, um, drum on stage with like her favorite indie rock band. And it's only because, God, I don't even know what you sent me about Extra Celestial at that time, you know? Like, um, and Jim does a lot of guerrilla stuff. So physical mail, um, I love stickers and stuff like that. I still love physical stuff. I love seeing weird stuff on telephone poles when I'm using the bathroom. I love seeing, you know, stuff strategically placed in there. So, um, I don't know. I want to hear a lot about, like, the Justice League stuff that, you know, y'all were doing at the time because, gosh, I mean, Justice League was such a huge deal, like, for Tampa, you know? So was there, like, a guerrilla element of that in the beginning? Well, we did, uh, a, um, we didn't, so, all right, long story. Um, through a friend of a friend, our managers ended up to be just two guys out of Tallahassee, um, Chuck Green and Ivan Rivera, and they started a little thing called One Shot Management. And the thing that was appealing to us is, is Chuck used to um, go to college at FAM with Stevie J. And Stevie J was a bad boy hitman. He made, um, like, pretty much all the Notorious songs. Like, um, so that was the only connection Chuck had to the music industry. And that was the only connection we had, really, to get our foot in the door, right? So we just exploited the hell out of that. All right, let's get him, get in our truck. And so we drove to New York. And next thing I know, I'm in the studio with Stevie J working on a Bone Thugs album, like, of all places. And, um, but, you know, that, 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 that experience didn't really go anywhere, you know what I mean? Like meeting people. Um, so our next step was we we did um, uh, we, we made a a CD. Uh, this is what CDs were. They were these discs that uh, you had to put in your truck to listen to music. Um, but uh, we we made one called uh, Thirty Eight Special and put like a little revolver around it, and we had thirty eight beats on it. And um, we got an A and R registry, and this is why I'm still a firm believer that you know, a, like we talked about, should you or shouldn't you? Well, why not try? We mailed probably like 400 of those out to every single A and R in the music industry that was on that registry. We mailed it to them, production team out of Tampa, production team out of Tampa, and sent it to everybody. And uh, one person bit. He was an A and R for um, for uh, Def Jam South. Um, so he was like, yo, uh, this new, new kid named Jeezy, um, he just, he's blowing up from this group, Boys in the Hood. They had that song. Um, so we went up there. Because we were in the studio working with Jeezy for a few songs, um, and uh, oh, by the way, 8-Ball MJG's here. Work on this. By the way, Joel Santana is here. So then that's just how it works. You got you to gotta throw yourself out there, but then you got to, like I was talking about perception, make yourself available. Talking about working with like the bigger artists, these artists would come through and do shows. We'd open up, studio. yo, just come in. Y'all want to record something for free? Bring your whole whole people in here, and then perception would be there, be spitting. They'd put them on the album. So, but that that I guess that was kind of a guerrilla way of doing things. Like just you know you you, you send it out to a bunch of people, um, and then make make every uh, you know opportunity count. Um, we also uh, features. Like nowadays, that's the best. That's still a no-brainer. Work with as many artists as you can. Get on as many people's albums because that's direct people that are gonna that are gonna hear you. Um, and we still flyer. We still sticker. Like if you walk around Evor, there's probably like you can't even. Every single poll probably has something on there from from our camp and what 
what we do, but it works, man. Strengths and numbers, and yeah. Uh, you know, um, guerrilla marketing's kind of it's changed. You know, guerrilla marketing used to be you know show up in a parking lot, snipe some posters, and now it's think about what what it is now. I always think about guerrilla marketing as a physical thing. Think about a pop up, a pop up, whether it's retail or you know you show up in a parking lot and just bust some rhymes. That is guerrilla marketing, right? So if you have the ability, if you've got 30,000 you know, followers in Tampa proper, and you can say, yo, I'm going to play behind the ice cream shop next Friday, Friday 8 o'clock, first 40 people get nothing. Um, if you have that ability, that's awesome. I mean, to me, that's guerrilla marketing. If you're exercising that muscle, that's awesome. Now, traditional guerrilla, I mean, I think about think about Red Bull. Bull. <laughs> I think it's, I think Gorilla is now stunting, you know, you get out there and just pull a freaking stunt and wear Duracell and you sell a million of them. So I think the scope of that's changed a little bit. Um, but you could just, just be bold and think about, you know, I'm not even going to say that, but just think different and then follow some trends. I mean, there's some stuff on TikTok that just, just works. Let's go do that. <laughs> yep. I will bite on, I mean, I've, now that you're saying, I've been on a, there was a show where they were charging $1,000 uh, if you were unvaccinated and $18 if you uh, yeah. were. Yeah, yeah. And I love Paul, the uh, promoter. And uh, that's a story that I just wasn't going to not write. You know, I talked to a lot of people ahead of that and Tom DeGeorge who I respect a lot and told me I was an idiot for writing about it, but I couldn't not write about it. So while that kind of stuff works and it results in earned media and everything, I, I don't know that it's your ticket, but that worked, you uh, know? Writing songs um, that, that stand out. Um, all right, so like last year, uh, Halloween, um, or, or even as like uh, Christmas albums, stuff like that, right? You, know, you do stuff for Christmas. I guess if you're a Christian artist or pop artist, uh, I've never met a hip hop dude that made a, you know, Chan Silent Chance Night the song. Huh? Chance the Rapper. Uh, he did a Christmas album. So he's kind of a Christian artist. Yeah, he's kind of uh, Christian artist. There you go. Yeah. So, but um, on the flip side of that would be uh, would be um, Dochi last year. Yo, I gotta come cut this record. All right, what you got? She came in. It was like a week before Halloween, working with Symphonic, putting it out. Spooky Coochie. I wrote about that one. And, that, like, it, and she, she went off on it. And like, that was the pivot point of my career. I was like, man, because, and they, like, I'm a Christian, right? I'll throw that out there. Like, um, and everybody, but I'm not like the weird about it. Like, I ain't gonna, you know what I mean? But like, it's like, it, you, you know, it, and Jay Brown, y'all know Jay Brown? Y'all know you local? His dad's a pastor. And she asked him to do a verse on the record, right? We're gonna do Spooky Coochie. So, it, w it was funny how that played out, but it was genius. It was genius. Like, how, like I'm going to take what's already happening right now. I'm going to write a song about it that's obnoxious and um, think outside of the box on everything. Everything. If there's an opportunity, whatever, in, in the climate, it, it, as, as political climate, speak out on it, man. If you see something's happening in Tampa, write a song about it. Like, just, just continue to use what's happening in current events because it will trend with, with your music right now. I just want to set up a meeting, you ready? Think about this in your head. All these guys are sitting around the table. This girl walks into the meeting. And they all look at her and she goes, guys, I want to call my band Spooky Cooch. <laughs> That's a killer day, man. I can't get over it. That's the most punk rock Spooky Coochie? Oh, I've never heard of it. I think that's a fantastic you should definitely thing. listen to the song. Not with your kids. No, I remember that song. That's what I was talking about when I got here. That's the first. That was my first touch on on, on Dochi, like, and I think that's what caught my attention. It was a, it was a Halloween show, and I was like, it was at the Bricks, I think, and the song was Spooky Coochie. And I remember thinking, Jesus Christ, I just want to write about this because it's so off the wall. Killer. Yeah. Guys can't get away with that, you know. When they, like, no. That wouldn't sound right. No, it's, 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 it's speaking to your... <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what you say? 
Yeah. <laughs> you can't get away with that. I think a lot of people can't uh, get away with it. Yeah, for sure. She's special, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, um, we're about to open the floor for the uh, Q&As. So anybody can come up and ask a question? Anything? You know, I'll say, I've, I've been to a number of these things myself on, frankly, both sides of the stage. And that's why I keep, like, interjecting and adding stuff because, you know, I want you guys to go away with something. You know, it's, a lot of these, it's just like, what, what? What are you talking about? You want me to just run out and write up a marketing program? Um, I don't know. I want you guys to go away with something. If you're really, like, desperate, or not desperate's the wrong word. I don't know, we'll talk after the show, but I hope this helps. Go ahead. <laughs> no, these guys, you guys have been excellent in speaking gems on all types of levels between marketing and different levels of the, of the career phase and building up. Um, my name is James with the University of Streets and Corners, uh, do brand consulting. Um, I wanted to ask if you guys had any specific gems as far as like developing your brand as an artist, um, especially like from early on to middle stages to whatever le heights you're trying to get to. Um, I think, I mean, I don't know. It's hard for me. The things that always stand out to me most about artists that I write about um, are the things that I kind of hear from other people that they do shows with. So like dependability, just kind of be in there, like perception. So yeah, there's like branding and like, your look and your feel and things like that but I mean at the end of the day it's like just a solid song and just being super dependable and reliable I think it's a small town and this is how life is like people talk a lot of shit about people and you don't ever want to be like the person that people talk shit about you like you don't show up or things like that but you know I think your brand should just be dependability and like just being a good person you know I think that's the strongest brand you can have Oh man, branding's now a bigger word than marketing, right? It's like, oh my god. Um, so it's overused too, but it's it's the right word because the way that we market uh, it, it needs a word like branded because we literally are all putting ourselves on Instagram all day. So um, I'm trying to give you something there. Um, like I said, I mean, branding, it's not overused. It's, uh, I had something there. Hold on. All right, come back to me. Come back to me. Yeah. Um, as far as branding as artists, you know, most, most artists that I know, like, uh, typically do their own just because that's what they, they can't outsource another company. So if, you, if you're good at, and this is typically your DIY artists that'll record themselves, they're also good with Adobe Spark programs like that where they'll develop logos, develop Illustrator, and be able, you kind of got to do it all. Um, uh, but it is on brand to, I think of branding, I'm, I'm sure you're coming from like graphics design and pho photography and um, I can, I'm, I'm, I do brand consulting specifically like for businesses. Um, so I'm working with their logos, their, their reputations, like you said, how people feel about them as far as maximizing their marketing. Um, so I was kind of looking for more ways to kind of even start to work with artists as far as helping their branding. Like, so when their product is music and people don't buy music anymore. Yeah. So it's like kind of a different space to attack that kind of looking for different ways to help brand. Play shows. I mean, yeah, play be shows. out, mm -hmm. play the shows. Like. I, that, that's what I say. Play the shows, have the music be available, um, have the physical assets ready. Like, yeah, they can have a look, and but like the branding changes all the time. Like, there's like artists go through so many phases of who they are, and even if it is like intentional and a brand thing, like I love that kind of stuff. Um, so as long You're as you have to determine yeah. the channels, you got to determine like this is a different channel set, right? So if you're going to work with artists now, like who, what channels do I go through to keep branding them, which that'll change your brand or uh, channel set, won't it? If you're pivoting from just, who are you branding currently? Uh, so a lot of the branding I do for myself, man, University of Streets and Corners, um, a lot of different projects coming out that you'll start to hear about organically over the next couple of months after years of putting it together. 
Um, but it's like I do the branding for me, so I know what my brand is, and I can I know how to help me. But I'm looking for ways to kind of help others. And if you guys had like some insights on the industry side, like as you guys market and do publications and all the things that you've experienced, if there's anything that you've noticed as far as like, okay, well, these people are doing this, but this will probably help them to maximize their efforts as far as making sure that people re remember them when they're when they're sending things out to to A and R's or to publications and doing shows to make sure if I do a show over here, they remember me here and they remember me when I do a show over here. And it's not like I'm just starting from scratch every time I market. Pick an artist, do it for free. Mm -hmm. Go get photos of them, put a site together, get an EPK for them, and then build that and start going to shows and be like, yo, I did this for this person. You know, um, I'm looking, I would really like to start working with other artists and then pitch that, you know, 100 bucks, 200 bucks, 300 bucks, and then the more, the more artists you do, the better you get, the more opportunities to do that. But definitely, like he said, going to shows and meeting people. All right, cool. Thank you, thank you. My name is uh, King Z the Third or King Z I I I. Uh, so what my question is is, uh, uh, what is the role of the record label in this current climate? Uh, I'm an independent artist, uh, but I want to start a record label myself, and I see that it's less important than it used to be nowadays. So what is the role of it nowadays? Um, I don't know that I can speak too much uh, on what you want the record label to do for you. I've interfaced with a lot of record labels, and, and they help me out. I want to say thanks to you. Uh, you play, um, you were on the bill at least, I think, I think it was through Forward Thinkers actually over at um, the Brad, I call it the Brad over in Tampa Park. Uh, right, you were on that bill over there, or maybe you were, you know, you work with Mike Mass. I've, I've worked with Mike Mass yeah. before, but I've met him a couple, I don't know if that was me. Okay, I, I feel like I've, because, how do you uh, stylize your name? Uh, Kingsley, I, I, Oh, maybe, maybe it's somebody, when's the last show you played? Uh, the last show I did was about uh, a week ago, Sunday, and I was at this underground show, it was at this, uh, High in Florida uh, event. Oh, maybe, so. maybe I missed that one, but I mean, I would I would say you want your label to interface with me, um, just in a positive way, get your record out. Um, but I mean, that's kind of stuff you have to work out with with the label that you're working with. I mean, I don't know. There's so many levels of, of the label, right? Like when you get to the major, like Warner, like you're they're doing everything, <laughs> millions of, of well, dollars. Well, man, that's a big question, but I can give you an easy answer too. Uh, the first answer is no. Absolutely, you don't need a label, especially now. You can put out a, you put out records by yourself. Here. What? And let everybody kind of hear this because somebody told this to me, and I, it made a lot of sense to me. A record label is a bank that really has their marketing channel set up to sell records, right? So they know everybody at Barnes and Noble. They they know everybody that sells records. In addition to that, they know everybody that plays records. They know everybody that works in the touring. So they know all those channels. So you have a bank with all that expertise. That's what they do. Now, they'll sign you, give you 100 grand, but you gotta pay everything back. I'm being short here. You pay it all back, but that's what you get for a label. The barriers have been broken down. Distribution is no longer needed. You can, just, you can put your record on 99% of ISPs. We know that, right? You don't need that. So you don't need them, but if you need bank, you need power, you need global reach with real professionals, yeah, then you, you would seek a label. That's how I look at it. Man, there's so many successful people without labels, of course, right? We all read about it, and it's real. Plenty of them. And there's plenty of people that, you know, not everybody needs to make 190000 a month. You know, there's plenty of guys that make 45 G's a year that love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we're kind of on the other, other side of the fence because now in this point in my career, we kind of had to form a label uh, because we felt like we could do it all as an independent label right now for Kinsey. Um, so we know, you know, a bunch of record producers, but now we feel like our net is a little bit big enough that way we could sustain him financially. Um, which is, like he said, you got to think about this artist. The artist got, has to make a living. We have to pay for that living right now. 
Um, we have to pay for merch. We have to uh, um, try to do as many many shows that we can do um, without seeking out William Morris or like CAA or some of these bigger. But th the first thing first is as a label, we're going to see, are you, a, again, what I said, are, are you a business right now? Are you, are you sustaining yourself right now? Are you doing shows right now? Are you putting out music? Um, and if you're not doing that, you're not, you're not ready for a label right now. Do you need a major label? No, but you need resources. Um, and it is just like being on a shark tank. How much money and how much stuff you're bringing in right now depends on the percentage because essentially signing to a label really is partnering with a label. Uh, you just get to use their resources and they get to um, you know, do, do the same as you being a, a resource or a product that they're selling. So continue doing what you're doing, put out albums, think outside of the box, buy merch, do all of that first. You absolutely don't need a label. Just go to every show right now and, um, and, and, and keep doing it until labels come to you. you know, that, that would be my advice. You can be a business. It's collecting all those pennies. Two good examples if you read up on, say, Wikipedia discographies. Car seat headrest, right? The guy was making records in his basement, yada, yada. Didn't need a label, doesn't want a label. But Matador, now he plays Coachella. The Matador record signed him, and now he's there. Another example is... Um, Eve's Tumor, who's on um, World Div Dominant. Eve's Tumor is one of the coolest artists ever. He doesn't need a label, but he got one. And now, you know, he's on all these all these big things, you know, where he, he wouldn't have been able to get that with labels. So, yeah, labels do things, plenty of things. That's my background. I like doing that stuff. Uh, the reason you need a label is before is just hands down distribution, radio and distribution, hands down you didn't have these streaming sources that you do now. So labels were always, always a bigger deal because if you're gonna get inspect, Best Buy, Walmart, like you're, you know, you're gonna be on the shelves, you, you absolutely had a label. Um, I think when Wendy Day, is, some of y'all look, look that up, look up who Wendy Day is, but she would broker deals for independent artists, specifically rap artists, but you would need 120 grand, bring it to Wendy. She would work out million dollar deals, is what she did. Um, she kind of started the, the um, the shift with uh, di independent distributors like Koch. Um, Koch was huge. If you're not on a major, Koch would distribute for you. Um, now uh, you have your distributors. You need CD Baby, TuneCore, um, or uh, um, say other one, uh, CD Baby, TuneCore. Uh, DistroKid. Distro a step above that are your independent distributors like Symphonic. Right, that are kind of invite only, right? Like you, you have ASCAP, BMI, and then you also have C CSAT, right? Invite only, like you have to have a label to go through it. Um, uh, but label, uh, independent artists and major labels will use Symphonic because you get more one-on-one -on -one experience and you're not a number on the shelf. You know, just if you were to sign to a label right now, bro, they, they'd sit on you for three years if they had to or more years and then just uh, uh, drop you, you know, depending because they're not going to sign you, they're going to sign 10 of yous, you know what I mean? And see oh, which one is doing the rest. I'm going to sit on there so they're not a competition right now. So avoid it as long as you can. I have a, one more question. Um, what do you think the, uh, do you, what do you, what's your opinion on artists? Artists I'm, and I'm not you, job. but I, I would. Yeah, uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Unless your streams and all your bucket collecting, if you're making real change there, and you can leave your day job, if you can, if you have a sustainable living with your music only, congratulations. And sure. I think there's a breaking <laughs> point. Yeah, like. Um, but yeah. most people are not there that I speak to. It seems yet. So. I don't know. I don't, I don't see any are. kind of stigma with having a day job. Like, yeah. I don't look at an artist and I'm like, oh, well, they still have a day job. Like, duh. Like, everybody has, like, five jobs, you know? So, I don't know. Everybody right now, dude, money with. is so scary. Like, if you have money coming in and it's not affecting... Now, if your day job is, like, sucking the life out of you and you can't make art anymore, then maybe you should consider changing your day job. But 
I don't know. I mean, money is money, and money helps you do your art. Yeah, money is energy, straight up. You need it. Like money is is the equivalent of energy, and uh, you need you need that to to keep the ball rolling. Um, when I was younger in, in bands, we would work at restaurants. Why? Because if we had a show on a Friday night and they wouldn't give us off, we'd quit and go to the next door, right? Like, I, I think by the time I was 25, I had about 50 different jobs, bro. Just because I, I didn't care. I knew all I want to do is music. And you wouldn't give me off, done. We're going to the next place and take off. You need money, you need money, you need money, you need money. Now, if your day job is like, affecting you it, it, at nighttime to where you can't do it or it, then you need a different day job right um so but yeah it, it's nothing wrong with that bro like 100 percent. any more questions all right All right, uh, so I'm an artist. I go by the name The Black Ace. You can just call me Ace, whichever. But I wanted, I have two parts to this question. The first part is you spoke about maybe like the artist's big plans that they come with. How, on a scale kind of, where would you put big plans or big moves in marketing versus doing shows? Like how important is it for you to be putting general advertisement out versus when you're doing shows? I, I mean, I'll speak to it real quick. I, big plans don't have to be crazy big, right? You, um, d different, prime example, right? Like, let's say, I don't know, if you had a song, Change the World, right? I don't know, Change the World. Yeah. Something that, let's just say, would it, you could do it at a high school, right? Or let's say you struggle with anxiety. Write a song about struggling with anxiety. Then make a, whatever the name that song is, is like Break Free. Then make a website, you know, ibrokefree.com. And then on that website would have your story and a little video of that story. Then you make I Broke Free wristbands, a 30 day devotion on how to break free. And now you, you start approaching all the high schools and colleges like, yo, as yo, anxiety's crazy today. Um, what what really helped me and I know helps people my age is dealing with it. I have this campaign of, of how to break free from anxiety. Can I come and, and perform for that school? And, uh, and, and obviously what you're doing now, you're pushing people to a product. From that product, they're gonna be pushed to the music, but they're, they're not, it's not about the music, it's about the movement, right? You can do that right now, a couple hundred bucks, right now. And guarantee if you sold a thousand of those books or some colleges would get behind it and be like, you know what, this is great. I'm going to buy all of these and give them away. I'm going to take them for my church youth group. I'm going to do this. Like there's ways to think outside of the box to be a business, you know, that, and that's like the gorilla, the, the marketing thing other than doing shows, you know, a shows, shows is where you, you get recognition and get people, but, but you have to kind of think outside of the box of how to make money and, until you have enough fan base, you know, um, so that the equivalent of merch, right? Um, but yeah, that, uh, that would be my take of that, of something you could do right now to make money. Yeah, restate the questions like marketing in relation to a tour date. Tell me that again. No, so like, let's say you had like an X and Y scale, right? And on one side of it is your general advertisement, like you were talking about stickers and putting up different things of like maybe just your name or your logo or something like that versus going and performing at shows. So what's the, not that this is the more important, but which would you say is more important to do consistently? I mean, one thing, I would listen to what Cliff said again, when the, whatever this video is, because that, you know, that's a really good thing, because that does, if somebody said, hey, I performed at 50 high schools across America, it was kind of my thing, it at least will get me to click on, on the, the music and I'll listen to it and I'll either say, oh, do you have an event coming up locally? Well, no, then I probably won't write about it because that's what we do. But I think what you're talking about is should you focus on one more than the other? I guess, yeah, for when you're, when you're a smaller artist. Like maybe I think you do them both know. at the same time, you know, because like Cliff was saying, you want to have merch, you want to have things people can connect to you with outside of the music. But you still have to do it in that physical space. 
I mean, I suppose you could do it on the internet and connect with people there and send them stuff, you know, your, your marketing things and things like that. But if you're at the shows, you're connecting with people and you're giving them things and, and you're giving them your marketing, your stickers and stuff like that. They stick it on their stuff and then the more and more you see each other. And there's an art to playing shows. You don't want to play two shows every week. You know what I mean? You don't want to be on every bill. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be at a show. Just because you're not playing a show, you know, doesn't mean you shouldn't be in the building. So um, I don't know if that helps. I think you have well, to do both at the same time. Let me just, I think I'll try to throw this in there, and I'm hoping this is what you're referring to. It's like, okay, how do I, do I, how do I play a show, and I don't have any marketing material. Okay, so play the show, get some money, get paid for that show, $35, okay? Take that $35 and get 50 stickers from Sticker Mule, get another show, and sell each one of those stickers for a dollar, and then you'll make another thing. So is that like where, so okay, now you've got, you're trying to generate money with a show? I mean, that's a, that's a path. Is, does this make sense? Yeah, what you're saying makes sense. I was, I guess, referring to doing outside of a show versus doing a show. Like, let's okay. say like maybe you hop on different bills and like you're here and there and then you have a dry spell because like maybe life or whatever, you like, you're just not doing shows at that moment but you still want to have your name in the mix of things, and that's where general advertisement comes in play. So I'm like, which, uh, I mean, there's plenty of people you could say like that, like you referred to earlier, that they may do like one or two shows every month, but it's still enough. Mm -hmm. Whereas for other people, it might not be the same case. I would continue, I'd play more. I mean, not more, just like one or twice. Keep the shows. I wouldn't lose shows. Like, being in the marketplace, being relevant, playing here a lot is, is important. Not, not oversaturated, but you should definitely play. I wouldn't have any lulls. Oh, you're talking right now, like, life getting in the way of you playing shows or COVID yeah. getting in the way of you this playing is shows. Like, in the real world. You should still release music and stuff. Play I shows. Think, I, I don't know. Yeah, I would play and not like take three months off or six months off. Now, that just imagine that COVID's not here. Yes, I would, staying relevant in the marketplace, I think it's important. Like have a show every six weeks, wherever it is, make it an event, and that's when you bring the market to you, bro, self. That's when you open your fruit stand, your show. Yeah. Oh, so you had a second part of your question. Here. Yeah, uh, smaller part, but still like relevant to like the advertisement part of it. At what point does an artist maybe focus on copywriting different things or trademarking different things? I quit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I write about when that stuff goes well or goes bad, so I, I don't know that I'm the best person to say that. I mean, you're, you're talking to somebody who's like been on the major yeah, labels here. As far as when you should copyright, like your stuff, like your music, I mean, if you're putting out music? I'm not even speaking specifically about myself when I say that, but I guess somebody in my position, yeah. Like if as soon as you release it. Okay. As I was soon. wondering about that. Like, if, if, if Perception co-writes, does Perception have to negotiate something and no. write so, at that spot? So with, with co-writing, how co-writing works is the right thing to do, right? And this is, we do a lot of work in Nashville where, like, I thought I was a good writer until I started writing in Nashville. Like, and you get around some amazing writer. Um, if I was in the room and I said one line, guess what? That's an even split. It, it is. Some you have to negotiate that on paper first, right? No. Like, uh, if, if somebody, and I've had artists say, we need a split sheet. Split sheets are typically, like, if you're in the room with Drake, yeah, and, like, you're writing a song, he's like, bro, you ain't getting all this. Like, you come up with something clever, I'll give you a fraction. That's when a split sheet, kind of, in, in my opinion, really, uh, y'all know a producer is a writer, right, on the album. It's mm -hmm. not going to say so-and-so produced. It's going to say writer, 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 like all the names on there. It's all even, even split. Um, but, it, you know, when you copyright it, I guess multiple people, the right thing to do is you're copywriting a song, put all the names on it, do it the right way. Distribution makes it easy because when you're putting it out, you're stamping your name on there. But the, uh, the old school way to do it, when like being a producer, if I made 50 beats, I'm not going to copyright each beat. I'm going to put them all as one work. Yeah, because it's $35. Well, 
whether I do 50 or $35 to the Library of Congress if I do one, you know? So, but I, I, de I definitely would, it, it, you know, I would copyright everything when you put it out. Um, I 100%, I think that's an investment. A, a good example is, y'all know Dark Horse, Katy, Katy Perry, right? That's the name of that song? Yeah. That was actually, um, man, y'all don't do, it, it was a Christian artist named Flame. Um, now I think Flame and KB, I think K, they work together. Um, and then uh, it was some dude made a beat, same drum pattern, same everything. Like he made this song on, you know, it was his beat. Katy, I don't know K, how Katy Perry or them found it, you know, uh, but he sued the crap out of her. Yeah, I mean, he got millions because he, you know, although he was just doing stuff kind of locally and he made that beat, it wound up on a Katy Perry album. And uh, he, he got paid. So, I mean, always copyright. Copywriting hangs a lot of people up. You know, it's like, what do I do? What do I do? Do I not release it? I've released a bunch of records that are not copyrighted. Really dumb. However, um, look on distrokid.com. It's a formal distribution house that does offer copyright stuff. Some paperwork. You can just do it there. I haven't used it personally, but I heard you can. That's a big, that's great to have. All right, well, that's it, thanks. Hey, what's up, guys? Um, my name's Evan. I'm here today, actually, as a video producer. Um, I am a lifelong musician, but I recently kind of got into video production world. And my goal, what I really want to do is work with local artists to provide quality content to people who don't have access to it, especially getting off the ground, local artists, um, small gig kind of stuff. And I've noticed a lot of people tend to rely on some real basic, just iPhone mounted on a mic stand kind of situation. And I think it's really easy to up that content for their own um, music production and video production uh, for live shows or for their own just media content. Can you guys speak to two things? Um, number one, if uh, the importance or usefulness that you guys find in some professional media content. And number two, how I could make myself accessible to the local mu music industry and local artists in that capacity. I mean, I think it goes both ways. You showed me a video from the factory that was shot on his phone and I would probably go check that band out just based on that video, but it's also because the show looked like it was nuts. Oh, sure. um, but that said, if if you can help the artist make a polished piece of you know media to put out, and I can click it, and it's easy to see and, and accessible, then that would help them also. As far as connecting with them, I mean, you're in a room with a lot of them now, and you can read you know any one of. We write about local music every week, so. There's bands playing, there's clubs everywhere that are, have local artists and then you just gotta talk to them, you know? I don't know how those conversations go between you and the artists when you talk about what you wanna do, but I think everybody has a need for a good video. And if you're willing to do that, then I just gotta talk to them, I guess. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, I mean, re with regard to professionally, I mean, the, the pr more professional, the better. I mean, just bottom line, the bar's high these days. You know, I would try to keep everything as pro as possible, not phone. Um, is there, you know, there's a lot of guys like you asking that. I got to be honest because, you know, kids got like iPhone 8s and now they're Spielberg. So they ask if they can do that because they leveled up. But regardless, um, I think to Ray's point, if you found out like, all right, who are the top five bands in Tampa that are making noise, and go to them. You'll probably have to give away some free cookies and say, hey, look, can I shoot you and make it look all great? And you, I'll give you a video. You know, Try to get some of your work done so they can show it. I mean, this is a no-brainer, I'm thinking. See if they'll d make some videos for local bands that are popular and um, see if it floats. And then the second part was... That was the, well, that was the second part. First part was the usefulness of that content. I think that was the part. Oh, the usefulness. Yeah, oh, gosh. I think video is imperative. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have to have video, period. And, I mean, what I, I mean, I would flip the phone. How do you monetize that? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of you, and there's lots of 16-year-olds that are really good at it, too. I'm not trying to do this. You know what I mean? Or <laughs> No, honestly, it's so, what you need. It's a crowded ahead. space. Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, you're needed. Yeah, I would offer some freebies. 
Oh, Any, sure. Anybody else? I'm babbling now. Yeah, um, it's gold. Video's gold, man. Like you need, if you could put out videos every single day on there, and you, you had somebody that's available to shoot that. Um, you know, we're coming out of pocket to put a videographer with Kenzie for the Buffalo tour, just because I want somebody on the plane. I want somebody, you know, getting on off the bus, going to there, shake, because I can take that video and now send it to other venues. Be like, bro, like y'all are late to the game. Look what he's doing here. Um, so video's gold. Um, I completely 100% agree with Jim. Like my 13 year old daughter can crush, you know, from TikTok trains people to have good eyes and, and piece stuff together. But um, I, yeah, it, it's a set. I'm a photographer. That's my passion. Like I kind of quit. I, I still produce music. Like I'll produce people that I want to, I guess. But um, you know, photography, like that's all I want to do is take photos, take photos. So I, I thought the same way. How do you become um, into one of somebody like guys like Daniel that shoot for John Mayer and all these all these people with these bigger brands? Hundred percent making yourself available and a hundred percent thinking outside of the box. Um, so some great local guys, Rob, um, uh, Motion Minds. Like I can just come off a list of some mm -hmm. local greats right now that are doing that. Uh, they're the homies. Like you can call them, and be like, bro, we got like. $500, you come here and do this, and they, they would say, yeah. Um, flip side of that, friend, uh, guy can't, can't, a friend of mine came to the studio to record us, or for us to record and produce this album. He went to another studio. I'm not going to name the names. But you can smell, like, when somebody's green, and if you are what we call a demo factory, right, you can take somebody for a ride really quick and take all of their money in this industry. And they got them for, like, probably two grand a song. They did a video, and, and I was like, how much you pay for this? Let me guess. And I, I was like, four G's. And he said, no, $5,000 he paid for this video at somebody's backyard. And, um, it, it, you know, they, they're everywhere. But for you right now, go out and get content. Shoot outside of the box. I think what we look for, because you can do so much on your phone, right? It feels like you're not being sold something like the day to day. But for a video, I want to see somebody that's doing a lot of post production. I want to see somebody that like thinks outside of the box with lighting. You can tell when something's a run and gun on. <laughs> I, I've probably seen a million videos on the Ebor parking lot top garage or out by Curtis Hickson a rooftop, mm -hmm. you know, just running. That's what we call a run and gun video. You got a gimbal and somebody shoots you and takes your money. Um, but put some thought into it and get, write it out, creative direct. Um, that's gold, bro. Like, Look up um, Tampa Sessions on Facebook. Just look them up. They do a lot of live streaming. They're pivoting out of that now. Now they're doing streaming from clubs live. And they probably need some help to make the overall product sexier. Mm -hmm. Tampa Sessions. Tell them I sent you. That's um, cool. Uh, yeah. One other. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, message, message me, man. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, mess, that's for everybody in here. Like, give it, I got I to gotta bounce, like, right now. <laughs> like, I was telling them, bro, I got to go, bro. I'm like, duty calls. We got another event, but I, I definitely, we're, we're an open book, bro. Like, so I don't know what part of the game you are, but you know, I know guys that, that could use a couple hundred dollar videos right now, yeah. you know, a hundred percent. So met and my, my, the easiest way to get a hold of me is Cliff Brown music. That's Instagram. Uh, that goes for anybody. We'll put you on, bring you in the studio, show you around, like give you some resources. Love this man. Thank you guys so much um, for hitting gems, man. I really appreciate it. And sitting in, in the the resource that these two gentlemen are, it's incredible. But yeah, get out there, shoot, bro. And hey, thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Um, we uh, we'll finish the Q and A's. Uh, Cliff has to uh, leave. Um, but if you have any more questions, that they'll they'll uh, finish answering any questions. Yeah, give it up. He's got all them moves. Every time you go by the bricks, look upstairs. He's in there. I'm going to come a knocking, man. I am. Go ahead. Yes. Tussing, Tussing. Hi, so uh, my name is Sign the Chosen. I'm, uh, I'm one of the gifted local artists in Tampa. And uh, me, I have a, my first language is Spanish. So I just had a question about, um, as an artist, how, how crazy, like, how far should you take your limits musically? Because I can make music in Spanish and English, but 
what um, what's confusing is who I'm marketing to. So sometimes I mix it up, but I don't. Re I can't really decide. So how would you guys approach that? Are, are you talking about how much you mix English and Spanish within one piece, one work, or? Um, no, it could be one song all in Spanish. It could be one song all in English. It could be bilingual song. So I feel like I'm capable of doing all those things, but and um, it's just what kind of the audience that I'm marketing to. I don't really know um, how to show them that. So I would cut both. I mean, where the, the simple answer. Tell me if I'm not seeing things correct. Cut both and market each separately. Okay. Yeah, if you have the energy to do like that kind of A/B testing just on a straight marketing standpoint and then serve it up with money. Make sure you have the metric that you want to measure the success of your release by and then just work off the data. But then maybe artistically, you're going to have to bounce it off of people that you're performing in front of and the people who know you and, and, and care about you. But from a marketing standpoint, maybe you do just do A-B test different types of uh, formulas and proportions and see which ones perform the way you want them to perform the most. Pay attention to the audience that you want to reach, that you want to be in front of, or that you want to play in front of. You know, I would just test if oh, from a straight yeah, marketing I mean, is, standpoint. Because you're, you're capable of doing both yeah. and producing a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, and at a confident level. Um, is, but like as an artist, like I'm kind of, I kind of approach it like a little kid. Like I want to do both. Like I want to show it to everybody the fact that I could do both. So that that's just where it gets a little confusing. So I don't know. Keep but, keep doing both, okay. and then see. You got to talk to people too. I mean, I would talk to somebody yeah. at radio or. What What was the hesitancy of not doing both? Um, the 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 audience like just finding a a, a fan base, something like that. So don't know? spread the the net too wide. Just right. focus on. English. Are you playing? Are you Spanish. playing out a lot right now? I mean, obviously, the people aren't playing a lot, but like, are you playing shows and stuff? Uh, not as often as I should. I mean, I would play shows. I mean, yeah. you go to Vibes of the Bay by Symphonic, and they have Spanish-speaking artists mixed in with English-speaking artists. Sometimes they're playing, they're singing in both languages, and I mean, you could see how the audience responds to them and talk to those people because they're already doing that too. I would talk to Jan. I mean. Janet was here, right? Yeah, she she knows. I would ask I would ask her or um, um, Jorge over there. That, I think they have a really good answer for you. Okay, thank you guys. Hello, I am Jacob Davies. I'm blessed to be able to be a singer full time. Um, I work like crazy weekends, but then I have some downtime during the week. I get bored. Um, I started making reels on Instagram. A few of them went viral. Um, it's a rush when it goes viral. You're just getting all these messages and I'm like, what is happening? But um, what, at what point, what are, what are, when are you selling yourself out? Like, I got all these ideas. I'm like, okay, that could definitely go viral. But I talked to my family they're like, I don't know if you should do that. So like, what point um, are you doing too much? Are you going too far? What do you mean your family said you shouldn't do that? Like uh, uh, video ideas or something like that, music promotion ideas. I mean, if you have the energy, why wouldn't you do it? Yeah, right? So you're saying go for it. Man, congratulations. I mean, wh yeah, I mean, you should seem like, are you should be happy about this. No, definitely happy, but I want to keep going. Can you do both? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I, I do both now. I would just do both until you can't do one, especially if you love singing. Yeah, yeah. Is it paying some bills? No, not at all. No. The videos, no. And, the videos and stuff? No, it's just a hobby. But the singing is, right? Yeah, singing, yeah. So that's like goes the other way with um, the day job question. Mm -hmm. Like, why wouldn't you just do both? Yeah. yeah your, why doesn't your family like it? Oh, no, just some of the ideas I have of like shooting those little reels. Like and they, don't, they say not to do it, but why? Uh, just like some outrageous ideas. Who cares? Like, are you gonna get like canceled or something? Are they like, are you like a proud boy or something like that? I feel like there's a setup. No, that's good advice. That's good advice. Dude, who cares what they think? Yeah, right on, right on. Cool. 
And then I'm, and then you guys keep saying be available. And I know even Cliff has reached out to me for some gigs, and I had to turn him down. Uh, should I start weaning through some of these gigs that are like, all right, they're kind of underpaying me. A lot of p places are paying higher. Like, should I start weaning through them all to make myself available? Because, because I hate to let these big wigs down with like they're reaching out to me like hey man can you play this gig for me i'm like uh, i'm busy well you gotta eat right yeah so but at the same time you kind of gotta get in the room with folks so you can do a bunch of gigs that don't pay that well and then you realize i don't want to do this because it's not worth it yeah. you know but a lot of times those gigs turn into crazy stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so yeah. i don't know what perception gets paid in the studio but and then also, you can be the crappiest artist in the world, and you can play more than the best guys out here. Um, like, I just got to a point where I'm, I'm, I'm filling the weekends, like, um, consistently. So, like, how do you compete with that? How do you compete with a guy who knows graphic design, who's making all these banners for all these restaurants, and they like it, but then you go listen to him, and it's like, how, how is he getting, how is he doing this all? You know what, what I mean? Oh, you mean artists that get on... Yeah, like, like hacks. Like hacks that just really know... Yeah, like people who you don't like their music, but they just promote themselves really well, and you're like, how did you get here, and why are you making more money than me? Yeah, exactly. How do you compete with that? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Why do you try to compete with that? Just, like, go do the thing that you're good at in the place that you're good at with the people who appreciate you and who pay you and who like you. That's good. Like, you don't have to compete with that. Let them go do their thing. Like, there's plenty of gigs to go around. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Well, do like, the, think about the flip of that, too. What's your name? Jacob. Jacob. Think, I mean, okay, so now that you know what the competition is on this, a certain platform, why not learn that platform in and out mm -hmm. and make a real double down on it and, you know, set a limit. All right. 30 days, I am going TikTok crazy, I'm getting the chainsaw, let's roll a dice. And then, evaluate. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm. And keep your day job, or um, your, your playing gig. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool, I appreciate that. Um, back to the first question, because I don't know if you guys understood me. Um, what point, like, I don't want to go too far and like be known for something stupid mm -hmm. on the reels or TikTok. Yeah, yeah. And then what I really want to be doing is like being respected. Because I, I don't want to be a famous musician. I don't want to be a wealthy musician. I just want to be respected. Yeah. And uh, your real stuff involves your face and stuff, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. you can't write for somebody else. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's tough. I, I don't know. Because you want to be known for one thing and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess if that's what your family was talking about. I mean, I don't know. It's hard to say. It's, Are they, it's, is it off brand? It, it's just craziness. You know? No, you just want to be known for singing. Yeah. Exactly. But you're also really good at like doing crazy videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a tough one because a lot of times that'll happen to artists that we write about too. Like I'll write about somebody being a YouTube star mm -hmm. and it kind of discounts all the other stuff that they do. But from like um, a show preview standpoint or web traffic or anything like that, sometimes right there in front of me, I have to focus on that part of their career. Mm -hmm. And I understand that sometimes I can ruin things for people, you know? So yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I have an answer no, uh, for, for you. Cool. Maybe like try to write the material for other people, but <laughs> maybe it needs to be you. Bad. I don't know. Yeah. Or just do, the, I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. No, I appreciate it. Thank you guys. All right, we have time for just one last question, if anybody has one. I think if you can make money off of YouTube, that's really cool. Uh, for me, as somebody who writes about it I, who, and who loves the internet, like when Froggy Fresh got booked for a crowbar, <laughs> as problematic as he's become, at first I was like, oh, Froggy Fresh, you know, viral. So I'm always like about writing about funny internet stuff, but it is always just like funny internet stuff. Like 
you're saying like I write about Froggy Fresh. Not that I don't take Froggy Fresh seriously, but I'm writing about the jokes that he does or writes weird songs. And now, God, who knows what he's doing? But I don't know if you can make money off of YouTube. Why wouldn't you? But at the same time, that's a weird conundrum that you're in. If you're gonna make money off of your reels, you're gonna be known as the reels dude, and nobody's gonna listen to your song. That sucks, you know. Well, I think you got to be on YouTube. I mean, the question is, there's YouTube artists or YouTube rappers, musicians, or whatever that like now, as opposed to before, like now they're being a little more like serious, I guess, or respected. And yeah, and they get booked for shows and they sign deals and stuff. Yeah, like, so I don't know. Is it fulfilling for you, like when you do it? I guess. Oh, I'm. I'm not. Worried. No, I'm saying it, if if you would, that's a. I don't care, like, you like, because, like, I've, I'm sure many of us love the internet, I love the internet, or watching YouTube videos or anything, what if one of us one decided to, like, go, like, hey, I'm gonna make videos, but I'm gonna move my focus of advertising from the general landscape to online? Your art and your energy is your art and your energy, like, I don't, you should do what you want to do with it, you know? I wouldn't worry too much about if I'm going to write about it. I do like writing about YouTube stars, but I don't write about all of them. I don't know that I got the question, but YouTube is my cable box. You should be there. Um, you should definitely be there. All day. I would, I've put more money in trying to market videos than I have any other channel. I think it's, I think it's great. I think it's the cable box. Um, yeah, got to be there. And then Instagram, re all of it. You just have to, everything. And of course, it's nice to have somebody in charge of it. You know, just, you got to upload all the, to 10 channels, all of it. Yeah, and you're, ta you're talking about being like the viral YouTube person, right? Like, I guess kind of, yeah. Like, or like it's a lot of work. Like, the viral guys that post every other day that, I mean, they make money. It's that, that model, I think it's great. But it's a lot of work. Is that what you're talking about, too? Yeah. Rick Beato is an old friend of mine that's currently got a music thing blowing up on YouTube. He's a white-haired guy. Um, I mean, he's probably got 200 videos now, and he's got millions of it. So he's making a living off of it now. He gets like a $3,000 check at, well, $90,000 check a month. That's great. I think that's awesome. I mean, I think it's skewed. I don't like the... It's none of my business how it's skewed, but yeah, as a living, I think it's great. But I do know creating 200 hours of content is not easy, you know. All right. Or I just want to say uh, you still get the respect, though, for your music because uh, Childish Gambino done some questionable stand-up jokes. Um, Tyler Creator, Eminem, uh, there's uh, plenty of people who do antics and still get the respect for the music. So as long as the music speaks for itself, you can live in both worlds and still get the respect. Yeah, that's the underlying thing. Your record still has to be good. Yeah. yeah. But uh, on that note, uh, we're going to end it off. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, God is good. Always ended on that. And I hope y'all get home safe. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.